Okay. I'm just going to let folks come on in. Oh, they're coming in so quick. I love it. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for coming to our second Z Civic Conversation. Uh, my name is Jordan Battle, and I am the Patron and Community Engagement Manager at Z Space. Tonight, we'll be having an open conversation about enforcing the culture and standards in our spaces as we begin the process of returning to live theater. But I want to first start with Z Space's land acknowledgement. Z Space holds itself accountable to the work of undoing oppression and advancing equity to overcome our country's bitter history of segregation and racial inequality. As part of that work, we must start by acknowledging that Z Space resides on the ancestral and unceded land of San Francisco, California, the traditional land site of the Maitush Ohlone tribe. Since we are meeting virtually, we recognize that we are all on different unceded lands. We pay respect to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are meeting, and we recognize those native communities and extend our deepest gratitude to those who have stewarded this land and offer our respect to their elders, past, present, and future. So I do wanna go ahead and drop this native land link in the chat so that folks can let us know whose land they're currently occupying. And then I'm gonna pass on to my lovely moderator, William Hodgson, who's gonna kick us off for the evening. Hello. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm really excited to be here for the second, I believe, civic conversation. Yes. Uh, my name is William Thomas Hodgson. So to get things started tonight, I'm gonna to introduce myself a little bit and then ask my guests to introduce themselves and then we're gonna get into it. Uh, this is a conversation and I just wanna remind everyone, this is a conversation between us on screen that you're seeing, but also between you all. So if you have questions, if you have aha moments, drop them in the chat. We'll have a question and answer moment later. So save them and you'll get to talk to us as well. Uh, so I am William. I am the current co-artistic director of Oakland Theater Project. I am an actor with Oregon Shakespeare Festival and Around the Bay. I'm a director. I'm kind of uh, uh, doing whatever will pay me, to be honest. Let's be real. Um, <laughs> and so some of the people that I'm inviting here tonight, well, I know through educating, through arts, through several places, and some I don't know at all. So I get to meet them with you. Um, I am currently on Chichenya speaking Ohlone land after spending three years in Southern Oregon. I am so glad to be back to what is colonially known as Oakland. So to get us started today, I'd like to introduce Tavia Jefferson. Oh, yes, Tavia, how are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Good evening. Good evening, all. Thank you all for being here. Please excuse any noise. It became an unexpected travel day. And so I am uh, in an airport hallway <laughs> making it work. Um, but I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. My name is Tavia Rave Jefferson. I am a performer, director, and most recently cultural coordinator, providing cultural communication consulting for artistic spaces. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I am currently uh, at Las Vegas Airport, McCarran Airport, also the, the land of the Paiute people. Um, so again, it is an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me under these <laughs> circumstances. No, that is dedication. From a hallway, welcome. <laughs> Amy, I saw you pop up a second. Can you tell us about you, Amy Longer? Absolutely. When I am not unexpectedly popping up on Zoom when it's not yet my turn, um, I am the box office and patron services manager at Shotgun Players in Berkeley. Um, I've been in this role for the past six years. In addition to my work here, um, I'm also a founding ensemble member of the San Francisco Neo-Futurists, which is a group of writer, performer, directors who produce a weekly show called The Infinite Wrench. Um, I will also say that I'm actually currently at the shotgun offices, um, which is on the land of, which is Huchin, the traditional unceded land of the Lee Shanaloni people. Uh, we are currently doing some outreach work with uh, Segura Tay, 
which does remediation of the lands. Uh, and I'll definitely talk more about that later, but definitely encourage folks to check that out as well. Beautiful, welcome. Uh, Lucy Ann, do I know you? <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lucian Colon. I'm the box office manager and usually the resident house manager at Oakland Theater Project. I am first and foremost a theatrical combatant and flight director and I am training for my teacher certificate. Um, I'm from the East Coast and I've been in the Bay Area for about four years and I am currently on uh, what was originally Miwok territory. Yes, Oakland Theater Project, I have a bias. Uh, Sheila David. Hello, good evening. Hi, Sheila. Um, my name is Sheila Devitt, and I am the front of house manager at the San Francisco Playhouse. Um, I am also a theater maker uh, and performer, um, and I've been based in the Bay Area for uh, about 18 years. Um, I also want to introduce, we have a few ASL interpreters here tonight, and so you're going to see them switch off throughout the night, but I want to get everyone's name in here. Katur, you're with us now. Can you tell us who you are? Hello, Katura Lee. I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. I am one of the ASL interpreters tonight. Happy to be here. Melissa McQueen. Hi, I'm Melissa McQueen. I'm one of the other ASL interpreters here. I'm happy to be here as well. I live in South Florida and I think this land is called Seminole. Beautiful. And Ray, uh, 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 I'm sorry, Candace, Candace Johnson. Hello, my name is Candace. I'm one of the other sign language uh, interpreters here, uh, pronoun she, her and I am on the land of the Piscataway people. Yes, I promise I won't interrupt y'all too much because I know you're speaking two languages at the same time, but I, I have to say to our audience, before this started, I was like, three black ASL interpreters, like this is the best event I've been to this year. Um, and I just wanna give props to Rachel Jacob Barnett, who is helping us with Zoom back there. We don't always give love to our, the people behind the scenes, but thank you for making this happen. And Jordan, you invited us all here. Can you say a little bit about your function in the world? Yeah, um, so I'm ZSpace's patron and community engagement manager. Um, a lot of folks who know me know that I get on my soapbox very often about how the front of house is left out of the conversation. Um, not that returning to theaters and focusing on art audiences and artists is not important, but somebody has to get the butts in the seats. Um, so for me, I was like, let me really take this opportunity to get us going because theater is coming back very, very soon. And those of us who this is our job, we are thinking about it now. So I was very excited that all these folks were willing to join me and be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm glad you said that. It feels like a bullet train, the way theater is coming back. We're just pulling the Band-Aid off. You know, auditions are happening, shows are happening. It's crazy. But I, I love that we're talking about this. And the theme that you've chosen for tonight is policing. And so I, I loved this. I was thinking about how theater is the art of paying attention to one another in, in the audience together, the actors on stage in the audience, all those relationships. But we don't talk about this enough. Um, it, it is a ritualized way to pay attention to one another. So the question tonight is, how are we policing those rituals? How are we keeping people within those rituals? So that might be actual policing, right? Actual law enforcement. But there's a lot of other ways that that policing happens. Uh, I wouldn't mind. I just kind of want to go around one more time to everyone and just say how your job is influenced by that idea of policing one another in our theater spaces. Um, I'll just do the same order. Tavia, do you want to kick us off? Absolutely, thank you. And I, I hope you all can hear me. If, you, if there's too much background, let me know. Um, my, what I do, what I've created as far as cultural coordinating was something that kind of happened as an accident. 
last summer as I was hearing all of these stories about uh, people being in spaces where they didn't feel they had a resource, where they didn't feel like they had an advocate to speak up for them. And having gotten my degree in communication studies and knowing a lot about communication theory, I recognize also modeling kind of after <laughs> modeling after the intimacy coordinator model um, that there needed to be an advocate in those spaces to discuss boundaries and protocols and these kinds of things as we're speaking about front of house we need to also be acknowledging that there are a lot of front of house people of color that need to be acknowledged when we're discussing protocols and boundaries and how they're dealing with traditional audience members and then how traditional audience members need to be educated on how to deal with those front of house members and unconventional audience members because as we're creating diverse theater we're having unconventional audience members who celebrate art in a different way that may be out of the ordinary or what people find appropriate. And we need to be able to have these discussions and educate and enlighten people past what we've always done. Um, because as everything is shifting, as we're really bringing in diversity in all areas and aspects of theater, we really need to make sure that we are enlightening people on how to experience that. So. That is kind of where I am. I love that you said diverse theater because that that is the moment, right? Like we no theater really has a season that isn't featuring a black show, a something. There might be a lack of diversity somewhere else, but that is that is what we're returning to. Amy, uh, uh, what about your role in, in this? Absolutely. So first and foremost, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my front of house crew um, when we did a uh, poll, like a demographics poll of the theater tied to our EDI work. Um, the front of house group is by and large the most uh, racially diverse of any of the various subsections of our organization compared to staff, compared to even performers. Front of house is really where you see the, the greatest amount of diversity, again, in terms of racial backgrounds. Um, as the box office manager and a white woman in the world, I recognize that there's a couple of things. First of all, as a white person, I am expected to be complicit with the policing of uh, any sort of person of color. Um, and so a lot of what I do is two things. One, um, lifting up the voices of front of house individuals on a staff basis in terms of reflecting what they're seeing in terms of patron interactions um, and also actually in the front of house space serving as a um, person who is actively refusing to be complicit in that policing. So when white patrons come to me and kind of do like the white person lean in to, to be like, oh, this is going on, um, repeatedly being like, what do you mean? Like literally just asking them to name what they're saying. Um, and usually that's based in racism. Um, obviously I still have a lot of work to do as anyone who works front of house knows, oftentimes there are interactions that go by so quickly that it's hard to register what exactly is happening. So I recognize that it's an ongoing process. Um, and I especially wanna name a couple of folks that I work with. Um, I've had two amazing box office associates, Ari Smith and Daniel Alley. Daniel is the current box office associate. Um, and I'd also like to mention the work of Lee Rondon Davis, uh, who is a shotgun staff member and also a front of house member. Um, there are again, myriad front of house folks who've done an incredible amount of work in changing the culture of the front of house space. Um, but those folks have definitely done some of the, the biggest pulls in terms of culture changes. So again, an ongoing process, but it is um, something that I've become especially aware of. Um, again, being expected to police and, and how I can push against that. I'm sorry, this is such a tangent, but I have an old dog here that is snoring behind me. So this is my airport background noises. If you hear a fart, I swear it is not me. Don't come for me. Um, you know, before we move on, Amy, I, I want to hear just like two more words about when you're talking about breaking expectations. Like, yes. what are the expectations? I think that's a, a, this is a great insight for me. I am not in your part of the theater doing your job. What are the expectations you come across those problematic things? Sure. So by expectations, you mean various white patrons coming to me with expectations of how the space is supposed to be? Is that what you're referring maybe, to? Maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, as has been evident in a number of stories, um, anyone who is a person of color who is being too loud in the space, for example, or taking up too much space, um, which is usually just any, as I'm sure anyone, again, I can't speak to the experience of it, but it does seem to be uh, very much outsized with the actual interactions. 
Um, it usually is just people talking and existing. Um, and I'm sure this will come as no surprise to any BIPOC person in this talk. Um, so again, that expectation to go in and uh, reinforce that by taking up any amount of space, it's too much space, um, I think is something that's put on us. So a lot of what I do is based in a practice. I, I worked in AmeriCorps doing a lot of mediation and um, behavior management, uh, which honestly has a lot of overlap with patient interactions in terms of recognize like dealing with the person and not and uh the person who's bringing the thing to me and using like dealing with them and not having to involve anyone else at all like uh de-escalating that person so that way uh it's not being again kind of off gassed to other folks because it often as i'm sure most folks know come from a place of inner instability versus actual issues that are going on in the space beautiful uh lucien can you tell us about this kind of the same questions yeah, um, I have absolutely, uh, to, to agree with Amy there, I've absolutely experienced um, the white patron coming to me and asking me to do something about a couple of people talking maybe during the show, maybe passing some food around. Um, and there is this, there is kind of this edge of, this is a new theater experience for a traditional audience. and. Um, especially at Oakland Theater Project, we do kind of bring, we tend to bring in uh, different folks from different walks of life. Um, but most of my policing, I think actually really falls on, yeah, kind of resetting those expectations for, for white folks um, that I'm not interested in, in doing that. Um, and I think a lot of the time, especially with Oakland Theater Project in specific, because up until right before COVID, we did not have a brick and mortar uh, theater. We were quite nomadic and we were on location a lot of the time. Uh, we were very often encroaching upon spaces that were in communities that are primarily um, residential people of color. And um, bringing white folks into those spaces, uh, bringing privileged white folks into those spaces required actually a lot more policing than I think I anticipated coming into this as like a new box office manager back in that moment in time uh, and house manager, uh, just because there is kind of this expectation that I can control the environment around us being outside and in somebody else's space and in somebody else's home. Um, and I think also as a woman and a person of color, when I was approached, I would be expected to take care of it in a way that was uh, I don't, I don't know if I want to say like demanding or condescending even, but yeah, there was kind of this moment of, okay, I have to kind of re-educate the dynamic and the culture here. Um, we are in someone else's space. Uh, we are not in our own home. We are guests here and we all have to act like that. What a, a beautiful philosophy. We are guests here. I'm really interested as a woman of color, what, you know, we are inviting audiences into our space as theater communities. Can you describe a little bit about what this power that these audience members feel like they should have over you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that it's, it's quite like maybe a restaurant, right? If something's wrong, you expect that you can say something to the manager and they will just fix it and send you out a free dessert on top of that. And that just can't be how it works, um, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, we are, like I said, especially with Oakland Theater Project, when it's a matter of, um, for example, this past uh, season, we've had a drive-in season, uh, kind of like a drive-in movie theater experience where you're listening in the like from the radio audio in your car and watching from your car um and not just from patrons but from even some people behind the scenes there was this expectation that we could control the environment around us and we're outside in a space that is a neighborhood is a residential neighborhood outside of this parking lot um and there is no you will not find me policing people in their own homes on a wednesday night asking them to be quiet while we're going to be loud five nights a week and there's just this, this kind of expansive perspective that I think uh, people don't have and expect things, they, they have an expectation, a preset expectation of the way they expect their evening to go. Um, and yeah, and I think we just need to reroute that expectation 
and really emphasize and hit home that this is the like theater is for the people right like it is not this I you know if you want to go to New York and see a Broadway show you can do that but this is not that like this is theater for the people by the people in a people's space it's not your five-star restaurant I'm not sending you out a free dessert oh say that this is not Disneyland <laughs> yes um Sheila same questions we're in the world yes um William, I so agree with uh, the comment that you said about uh, it feels like it's just a bullet train. We're just ripping the Band-Aid off. And in that spirit, I want to just take a moment to uh, slow down and back up. I feel like I zoomed through my introduction and uh, I left out a couple of things. So I want to go back and say uh, that my name is Sheila. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am zooming in from San Francisco, traditional Ohlone land. Um, I have flame colored hair. I am wearing a black sweater. I am sitting in front of a blue curtain. Uh, my access needs are met. And I do often take notes as I am listening. So if you see me looking down, I'm probably writing down some comment that I heard that I want to make note of. So... With that said, thank you for allowing me to take that time and uh, ground myself in a full introduction. Uh, and um, thank you, Melissa, for bearing with me through that. <laughs> um, I work for the San Francisco Playhouse, um, which is one of the uh, one of the busier theaters in San Francisco and in the Bay Area. Prior to COVID, we produced six main stage shows and three um, uh, secondary stage shows uh, every season. Um, and uh, we have an active subscriber base. We have uh, an active um, education program with our uh, Rising Stars program, which brings uh, high school students into the theater. Um, and um, we are also in uh, an interesting venue. We are very fortunate to reside in a, a beautiful classical old theater uh, up on the second floor of a hotel. And there's another performance venue on the floor above us. Um, where uh, there are often events with um, amplified music. So um, I can relate to some of the experiences uh, that Amy and Lucienne have shared um, of how we set the tone in our space. Um, some of you probably know that the San Francisco Playhouse refers to itself as the empathy gym. Um, and the, the idea behind that is that when we're all watching a show together and um, experiencing the same emotions, it makes us relate with each other uh, more sympathetically, more empathetically. Um, so I do think that our company really does try to foster that, but of course we, we are all continually learning. And in my position as a front of house manager, um, I am sometimes approached to negotiate tensions, I'll say, between patrons. Um, I am sometimes asked to, uh, um, sometimes the stage manager will contact me and, and let me know that someone's taking photographs in the house during the show, which is a violation of union rules. So I'm asked to go in and find that person and ask them to please delete those photos and please not take any more. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the venue that exists above us, sometimes I am asked to go to that other venue and ask them to turn their music down um, because we can hear their bass. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and I think that we sometimes walk a delicate line. Um, we can't please everybody all the time. We try and make it as comfort as mm, not necessarily comforting. I'm not sure that's quite the right word. We try to make it 
as inviting uh, a space as possible for everybody. We, we want people to return. Theater wouldn't be anything without our audiences. Um, and I think, you know, um, Amy mentioned a little bit of her background. I also have a, a little bit of a background in uh, conflict resolution. Um, and I think, you know, we're just navigating that space to help everybody feel welcomed within the same space, no matter what their, their backgrounds are, no matter if they are a seasoned subscriber who's been with the company since its first season, or whether they're um, a single ticket buyer who's a tourist who's never been to San Francisco before, or whether they're a, a high school, maybe from a school across the Bay. Um, we we want to foster all of them to feel welcome and have an enjoyable experience. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, but I just I want to point out there's kind of a buzzword that a lot of us have been ruminating on for the past year: urgency. And I, I sometimes there's some conversations where I have where I don't think we're being honest, where we can actually eliminate urgency. And I really feel that now that we're all starting theater and I'm like, oh, this is the exact same, you know, but I, I really appreciate you taking the moment to slow down, because I, I think when we can recognize the urgency, what we know is it's hurting us. It, it's it's um, not letting us be our full selves. So so thank you again. Um, Jordan. So you are a front of house manager and you actually also came from where I started, Berkeley, Berkeley Playhouse. Um, and I, I'm really interested in your perspective as a woman of color. You know, you will, you'll, you might have something extra to sprinkle on uh, what everyone said so far. Yeah, uh, thank you. Definitely feeling very similar experiences to Lucianne and actually to Amy, which always makes me laugh. Um, because I am a medium skinned black woman, I am sometimes more acceptable for patrons to approach. And because I learned at a very young age that you can still be authoritative with a smile, that uh, I, I do often get the patron lean over um, from white patrons who are like, but you're not, you're not like the people being difficult. So you can help me, right? Um, <laughs> but on the flip side of that, <laughs> Um, and I, I've told this story in a couple places before, like Berkeley Playhouse, we've done shows, like we just did Dream Girls before COVID and Memphis. And I can tell you when the little old black ladies see me and I'm the first face they see, people cling to me and they do not let go. They will ask me where the bathroom is. They will ask me for parking. They will not talk to anybody else because I am the face that they feel comfortable with. And that's something that, I've been house managing for probably about 12 years now. And that's something that I still struggle with that I see that people are like, you have to see representation. You have to see people like yourselves in the front of house because that, that power dynamic can make people really uncomfortable. That's how your audiences don't feel welcome is if they're not sure who they can go to or if the person who is you know, the person in charge is someone who they've seen who automatically like flips a switch. And I don't mean code swipping, switching, I mean like flips a switch and how they talk to you. It's not, it's not always a welcoming or inviting environment. Um, so I always, it's, I always struggle with making sure that like my front of house staff understands that my experience as a house manager is probably unlike any that they've ever experienced. But for my front of house of color, I want them to also know they probably have never had a front of house manager of color who can they can go to who can say, I know what you're talking about. Let's brainstorm or for my front of house who are white, who, who have probably never had a front of house manager of color, that they should also still come to me because I can probably help them unpack some of the, the things that they're holding on to that they aren't quite sure that they experienced. So like, I feel like I get both sides of it purely because I am just just light enough for folks to feel comfortable with me. You know, Mia Mingus talks about a culture of accountability that once someone feels comfortable to let you in on one problem they're having, one microaggression they've experienced, that they likely have others bubbling under the water that they're gonna be, and as that relationship grows, they're gonna start sharing those more and more. So as a black woman who has been to a lot of theater that has been in the front of house of several different theaters, could you spell out 
some of these common microaggressions that people are experiencing? Oh, goodness. Um, yeah, we only have 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, like folks have said like, oh, this person's being too loud or, um, oh, they're, they're, they're singing along with the song. It's hard for me to enjoy. Um, oh, I will, I, I worked at Cal Shakes as well. And uh, there was a show where the audience like somebody in the audience was heckling the per performance um, to the point where they're like, you shouldn't lecture me on how to feel about race. And it was during the performance. And I'm going, this is unbelievable because the show wasn't even like really about race. It just happened to actually be people of color on stage. Like those kind of things where some people just feel like the, the audacity is whatever they just wanna say. And I'm, yeah, we only have, we only have 90 minutes, William. I couldn't, I couldn't go. <laughs> may I, yeah. may I, may I chime in? I, a, a couple additional, when we're talking front of house, um, something that I've been working on with my box office people from another institution, uh, patrons only speaking to white staff, um, avoiding them at all costs. And then if and when the season may include non-traditional casting, Victor, or villainizing the people of color that they see at the box office because those are the only people that they can see and, and speak with. So then they villainize the people of color as if they have <laughs> created the season. It's like, no, they didn't pick a black glory in, in Oklahoma. You know, like it wasn't their decision and it was more than likely a white man's decision. And it is what it is. You can't, it, you know, we, it is what it is. We're not going to change the season, ma'am. So good luck, you know. Don't box Just me. other minor. It's other box me. It is. It is what it is. Tavia, you said something okay. earlier about um, basing your philosophy around this on intimacy direction, and I have to say, in my first experience with intimacy direction a few years ago, my first thought was like, "It's going to censor me. It is. It is another process of bureaucracy that is going to stop my creative decision making." And what I learned is it is still a theater practice. It is still very yes and, but there is a compromise. You know, you're, you're always gonna get to the same place, but you're taking in all of the elements, you're taking that all into account. So with that philosophy, how do we approach theater? Which I, we just had four testimonials from front of, front of house staff. Three of them mentioned race. And I, I wanna point out, I did not say race. We're just talking about policing each other. So this is a common experience mm -hmm. we're having. And I think something yeah. we, we don't always talk about in theater is, Lord, look at all of these audiences are white. When your black friend comes to see your show, you know where they're sat. And you look at a lot of these donors and they are white. And you look at a lot of these stages and they're brown, 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 delicious. So how, how do we, how are we compromising in here? What, what are things that you've learned or, or things that you wanna project into these processes? One thing I really have appreciated about it in my studies with intimacy coordination and direction is the um, the ideas around boundaries and structure, right? So there are certain terms or, and there are certain actions that you don't take in a tech or rehearsal process. Um, and that goes the same for cultural sensitivities. And there are certain phrases that we use when we're discussing, we're very, uh, we are very biological, we are very clinical when we're talking about the body. Right. So we need to be that deliberate when we're talking about if, if for whatever reason there is racially sensitive material within the text, we need to be that deliberate when we're using that text. Um, uh, Jordan said something about, you know, the microaggressions and how those are, are showing themselves from a communication theory standpoint and just thinking on, on my experience with intimacy coordination we've got to get to the biases, right? We've got to get down into those implicit biases, really understand and dismantle those so that we can then move forward in recognizing what those are and how they're showing up in our behavior towards, in our behavior as an audience member, in our behavior as a patron, in our behavior as a board or leadership or staff member. Um, and what I, again, what, what I really <laughs> uh, discussed is that nobody is really willing to do that work, right? Um, I found it really interesting that Sheila was, you know, talking about slowing down. 
one of my biggest fears about theater coming back in such a big way is that we've gone 14 months and nobody's doing the work. Nobody's investigated their biases. Nobody is really deciding what those protocols are. What are those boundaries? How are we educating our staff, our audiences? Are we putting it in our marketing? Are we being deliberate about these statements that we're posting everywhere? You know, it's Black Lives Matter and Pride Month and all of these things. What are you doing? What are you actually doing? How is this, uh, how are you going to show and prove? And so uh, what I've had to let people know is that no, I'm not here to obstruct your vision. I'm here to improve your vision because as we all know, when you're especially talking from a creative standpoint, when your cast feels safe, they perform better, right? When your staff feels safe and empowered and they have the tools, they work harder, they do better, they trust you, your credibility is higher, and then the value of the entire company is increased. And so it's just, I don't think that people recognize that it's a trickle effect, And we, but we've gotta start from the bottom. We've gotta start from foundation and exploring all of the things that make us uncomfortable it is where it starts. Mm, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm listening. I'm learning from this panel as much as everyone else at home. <laughs> um, so I've heard biases a couple times uh, uh, between the two of, of you ladies. And I just want to address we, the narrative so far I'm understanding from these complaints from patrons is that there is a specific group of people that are breaking our rituals, that they are too loud and we've decided it's not, it's not the time, that these are people are too big and we've decided it's not the time. Is that the, a true narrative? Are there other people that are getting away with breaking these rituals and we're just not talking about it? I, I don't know. Does that inspire anyone to talk? I mean, sure. <laughs> One of the things that this that this conversation in general brings up to me is um, imagined uh, risk versus real risk, or um, imagined uh, safety versus real safety. Um, a lot of the things that come up in terms of microaggressions, or um, again, issues with patrons, whether or not they're related to any just in general, when someone comes up to me and they're escalated, emotionally escalated, there's usually a disparity between the fear that they feel or the safety that they feel that they have versus their actual safety. You know what I mean? Like there's, if uh, it becomes a challenge to that, which is why I mentioned before about dealing with that person who comes to me with the concern because they are obviously escalated and what they need is to get to a place of de-escalation so we can get to a point of education and communication. Um, and oftentimes that's really hard to do when you're at a ticketing booth, you know, handing off tickets to people. There's a huge line at concessions. We're starting in five minutes and someone comes to you with a problem. Like one of the things that I grapple with a lot is how to deescalate things to the point that we can get to education in a very short amount of time. Um, so what that means in terms of theater making in general is I think that there are lots of opportunities to take risks in positive ways. There are lots of ways to, to push boundaries and do all of this. Um, but what it also means is creating an environment where any patron um, recognizes uh, that we make it clear to people where areas of safety are, um, regardless of background areas where they can talk to people. Like Teva, your work sounds incredible in part because it provides uh, information to individuals about like what's actually going on in very clear cut terms. Um, and so this is very convoluted and hopefully it's making some sort of sense, <laughs> but basically I'm, I'm very excited by um, moments both at Shotgun and at other institutions of creating spaces in the lobby or on the website or just um, letting patrons know where they can find more information in terms of what we're doing and why. Um, and also venues to raise concerns, ask questions, so that way, when things do come up in the space, they're less likely to get emotionally escalated, again, whether white patrons or BIPOC patrons, but that they're going into it front loaded with information so they can, they understand what, what our expectations are in the space and what our, um, what risks we're doing on purpose, <laughs> whatever those risks might be, and again, the why behind it. Hopefully that some, made some of that sense. Absolutely. <laughs> I really love this idea of safety versus comfort too. What do you have a right to? What, what do, will we definitely address? And what does everyone have a right to? So we're, we're not gonna address because they have the opposite concern. 
Um, I also want to open this up. We are talking about race so much, um, and I think it's important. We are in, this is the moment where we're talking about policing black and brown bodies, but I think there's other groups that experience this divide too. Is there anyone else that you can say is not being represented in our theaters or, or in our theater rituals? Oh, I can absolutely jump in that like youth, like the reason that we're, why are we not creating policies and like environments that you feel like they belong in the theater? That's how theater lives, that's how it grows is we need to create spaces where youth know that they can come and be themselves. And like, I have house managed so many student matinees and I house manage a bunch at Berkeley Playhouse. And it's like, where are the kids taught what's okay and but also what why are we enforcing the same cultural norms on youth that we've accepted as adults like the, the the youth are the next people to come so why are we not teaching them or why are we not learning with them how they want to respond to theater because theater is becoming more interactive like i feel like that group is not being <laughs> represented either yeah oh i totally feel that and as an actor, I got to say that some of these rituals that are, are well and widely understood, I don't like. It's, it's, it's great when I get to hear applause back or it's great when those 13 year olds are singing along with me or, you, you know, so it, depending on your perspective, it's, it's a rule or it's not a rule. Um, Can I just uh, jump in on there? Um, I, I wanted to um, just thank uh, Tavia for mentioning healthy boundaries. And when and communication, I think those two are always, always important. And when we know what the expectations are, that can be uh, very grounding and very comforting. Um, and I think when when we're not quite sure what's expected of us, that's when it gets unsettling and we get nervous and a little agitated. Um, and uh, I think the more that we can communicate and reiterate the same message again and again and again and let people know what the expectations are, what are the guidelines and the boundaries uh, in our theater space, um, the, the more room there is to play within that. Um, and I also wanted to um, add to what you just went, mentioned, William, when I'm attending a show when I'm not uh, working a staff position, but I'm just in the audience going to see a show. I love it when the audience is engaged. You know, I love it when they're vocal. Um, and, and personally, I love it if I feel like I have a permission to be like that. I don't want to be disruptive, but I want to give back. That's that dynamic that makes live theater more special than going to see a movie or watching television because it's a live interaction. And if you have that um uh, a little bit of vocalization you know i think it's that's part of the the sparkle and the magic and uh i think it's really sort of disheartening and dampening when when you get that shh. so Mama. i think we we have to make room for i so i think there's a, a really clear distinction at least it's clear for me that if people are vocal because they are engaged in the show, more, hooray, yes, let's encourage that. But if people are being disruptive in a way that is not engaged and that is distracting other people from the enjoyment of the show, that's where we need guidelines and remind people, all right, look, this is, this is what we're paying attention to. Ugh, I love that. I'm kind of... I really feel like a lot of the microaggressions I've experienced are not moral decisions that these people are making. They have an expectation or it's ritual or they're act they have an anxiety that they're transmuting into aggression. And so the question of the night is, how are you as uh, box office folks and also people that, that talk about this work, how are you or how should we be preparing to invite audiences back into this space? Um, how are we taking care of people who don't feel like they have a voice? And also, how are we taking care of our white community? These people that might be annoying sometimes or might have a different opinion sometimes, or you know, this isn't only just white, this, how are we taking care of all of us? I don't think anyone's answer is to kick a specific group of people out. So how are we helping them recognize that their aggression is actually X or 
I hope I hope this question is clear. And I kind of want to hear from everyone because I think we're talking about imagination. Tavia? Yeah, I'd love to, to chime in on that, mostly because it's um, some investigation that I've been doing recently and we've kind of had a brainstorm. And, and my first thought, and we're going to see how it goes, is the marketing, right? Um, now that we're now that seasons are opening back up when you send out your season letter rem, send a reminder you know in in your letter from the president that we celebrate all ethnicities we celebrate all um uh expressions of enthusiasm towards theater you know and it doesn't have to get too specific in the marketing because then we'd be giving a whole presentation which then they would need to pay me. So that doesn't really make sense. But if we are offering just reminders of our values within our, our within our marketing, within our PR as an institution that's saying, this is what we represent. This is what we believe. If you are on this train, join us, right? If you are about inclusion, join us. If you are about full, total, free, liberating expression, join us. Um, that's not going to solve the problem. Yes, we understand that. But then we've got the boundaries and protocols of we, we don't exclude people for expressing themselves. It says it right here in your season opener. You know, thank you so much. Have a seat. And, and so it's, it's just going back to the text, um, but being very, uh, very clear on what you want to see within your space and reinforcing that as often as possible. That does remind me of what Sheila is saying. Like sometimes we learn these rituals because someone else shushed me at the last performance. So now I'm shushing here. If, it, if it's not stated somewhere, how are you gonna change the culture? Is there anything else people are thinking about as we invite, yeah, Amy. Yeah. I. So Shotgun was in a somewhat uh, advantageous position. Prior to closure, we were, as I think I may have mentioned before, undergoing a, a small theatrical renovation, which included a little bit more room in our lobby um, and like a renovation of concessions. And we've kind of used that now as a way to leapfrog into discussions around accessibility, um, not just relative to physical accessibility, but general accessibility when coming to the theater. So uh, we haven't done it just yet because we want to do it closer to when we're reopening because as I'm sure as anyone who works front of house knows, the, uh, you can front load as much as you want. The number of people who read their emails is not as high as you want it to be. <laughs> Bless all you patrons. I love you all. There. I'd move mountains for you guys. Please read my emails. I promise there's good information in there. Um, <laughs> But along with that is uh, putting forward information again. So one of the, uh, William, you were asking about other forms of things being open, not relative to race, but other avenues. Um, we recently changed our bathrooms. So last season we changed our bathrooms to all gender bathrooms. We had a lot of signage about it, a lot of information about it. Um, and it was very difficult for some individuals, despite the fact that the restrooms themselves are closed off. Um, there were some elements that were absolutely uh, understandable in terms of some confusion and wayfinding around where folks wanted to go according to how much privacy they wanted. Um, so again, things that were brought up that were very helpful to hear as we move forward so we can get folks where they want to go. Um, but part of the thing about, again, reopening is using this as an opportunity to, for example, discuss the our, um, all gender restrooms, a little bit about the reason why we're doing it. And along with like, when you come to the theater, if this is the one you want, maybe don't go to the one right on your right, even though it's right there, that one's the least private. So we've kind of ranked them according to privacy now. If you want the fully private one, this direction, just behind this wall. Um, so there's, again, a lot of information going on there, but we're also using that as a way to talk about community agreements that we've written up, um, which were again, uh, headed up by our EDI uh, committee, which are relative to expectations in the space. Um, Again, hopefully folks actually read it, but it's a little bit of the thing that you can point to. Like we'll have a physical sign in the lobby saying, hey, by buying your ticket, you agreed to these. So this is what we expect. Um, so again, we'll see how many folks, I'm very, again, to anyone who's watching, please do read your emails. I, I will, again, do what, anything for you. You wanna take it close to the front? I'll find you and take it close to the front. Just read your emails. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think that there's ways to front load it. Very excited about it. Um, the thing that does always kind of just stick in my mind is how we can enforce that in implicit ways and explicit ways when folks actually come to the theater for the folks who haven't uh, seen that front loaded information. Mm. And I want to point out, everyone's from such different theaters and different areas with different programming. So there's probably going to be a lot of um, solution oriented ideas that are vastly different and won't work for other people. So I also want to invite you to come up with your own ideas. Maybe you're not implementing them, but things you would be excited about. It's hard. <laughs> How do we change the world? <laughs> it's a big question. Um, oh yeah, Sheila. Uh, William, I, I think you've mentioned a couple of times um, the word ritual. And uh, I love that in theater. Theater is very ritualized. And, um, and I think sometimes there might be different sets of rituals for different kinds of theaters. Like I know when I go to see the San Francisco Mime Troupe on the 4th of July in Dolores Park, I have my ritual. I've got my, my picnic bag that I pack, right? And I'm gonna go sit in the park and watch their show. And uh, if I'm gonna go see a show um, at the San Francisco Playhouse or ACT or Berkeley Rep, it might be a little bit of a different ritual. Um, that said, those kinds of rituals for regular theater goers are pretty deeply ingrained. They become the kind of habitual behavior that we don't necessarily think through consciously every time anymore. Um, and as we invite new theater patrons, um, they might not have that habitual behavior established. They're learning, what are the protocols? What is okay here? Do I have to dress up? Is it okay if I just came in what I wore to school or what I wore to work that day? Um, can I eat in the theater? Um, so there's, there's all these different little questions that regular theater goers already know and already feel like they're very uh, familiar with and oftentimes also feel entitled to coach other people. Um, and I think what Amy said about, you know, just reinforcing that communication is very important, whether it's in the email newsletter that you send out or signage that you have posted around the space or modeling behavior. I love that. I would love to say something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Sheila, thank you. Um, uh, Rose just posted this actually in the chat, which is funny. Uh, I think we, I think it would be really nice to get away from the term regular theater goer um, because I, I, and please correct me if I'm incorrect here, but uh, to me, regular theater goer is not necessarily the word when we're trying to address traditional theater goer, i.e. kind of privileged white person who has spent their life going to like a nice theater where you dress up and there are standards of conduct. Um, that is a type of theater and there are other types of theater as well. Um, as somebody who is not wealthy and did not grow up wealthy and did not grow up getting to go to really nice theaters, but kind mm -hmm. of was at my community theaters and at my school theaters and my regional theaters, um, I was just as much a regular theater goer. Um, and actually this is a conversation that I've had uh, many times with a good friend of mine who studied dramaturgy over in London. Um, I think there's something really interesting in kind of addressing um, these expectations from traditional theater and how inaccessible and classist those things actually can be. Um, asking somebody to dress up to go to the theater is a nice idea. We used to do it on airplanes, but now we go in our pajamas and it's okay. Um, and it doesn't make the ride any worse. It actually makes it a lot more comfortable. Um, things like, yeah, and I mean, I totally agree with, uh, it has, you know, the history of that has absolutely bred this, this dynamic of, 
people feel entitled to then police the behavior of others that they do not see as fit, as, as conforming. Um, and it brings up a memory I have of uh, my friend Caitlin Ortega and I. Uh, I forget the show that it was, but it was at ACT. And we were, we're regular theater goers. <laughs> and, uh, we laughed at ev like everything that we laughed at in that show, not a single other person in that entire audience thought was funny. And any time that e the entire audience was laughing, we were, you know, chuckling, but it was not, it, like the comedy did not hit us in the same way. And that in and of itself could have been perceived as disruptive. That very well could have been perceived as something to be corrected because we were making noise in a time where everybody else was not. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it, that was, it's just a good opportunity to look at the terminology of these things, look at, is this even a dynamic that we want to keep enforcing or is it something that we wanna say, hey, actually, maybe it would be better for the future of theater if little by little starting here, we start implementing actions and, and words and behaviors that say we can bring this down a notch and we can all have just as great a time uh, as we were before. And we can invite more people to have a good time in here with us uh, because we're not expecting them to be in high heels and, and be quiet when we expect them to be quiet um, and that goes all the way down to, I remember when I was in school for performing arts, there was this kind of taboo around, you don't, you know, you go to the bathroom before the show. You don't get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the show. And that's ridiculous. That's, that's an accessibility, uh, that's, that's an accessibility need. People have to go to the bathroom. Um, anyways, so I'm going to ramble. That's. I'm going to, I'm going to pause this conversation because I am really, really excited to, to talk about what you're talking about, Lucienne. Um, I also know that Tavia, you have a heart out at seven. Um, so I just want to make sure that you get to say a, a last piece before you need to leave. And I'm not kicking you out. Stay as long as you want. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I got to I got to go catch a flight. Lucien, that's a great point. Like, <laughs> it sounds so silly now. Like, what do you mean? I can't. I got to I have to be. Um, there are a lot of things within uh, when we're talking rituals and all of these things. It's like, why did we do it this way? And it's OK for us to it's okay for us to change it. I, I, I do have to run. I, I had gotten a, a question from a, a prospective employer the other day and he was like, what do you think about golden age? And I think he was saying it cause he thought I was going to tear it down and be like, I, you know, like golden age musicals are stupid and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, we've got to, we've got to value the foundation, right? We've got to appreciate the foundation. None of this would be happening if we didn't appreciate the foundation. Now we just have to restructure. We've got to make it work for us. That's what they've done every generation. And it's okay for us to value what they gave us. What is it, what they always say? Um, take the bone, leave the meat, or take the meat, leave the bone. That's something like that. One of those cliches that my grandma used to say. But um, if you want to hear more terrible cliches, I am having a workshop on cultural coordinating on Sunday um, where we will be talking just about what cultural coordinating is, as well as um, I will be discussing training to be a cultural coordinator. Something that I was advised as I was building this is um, this is a great idea, but you can't be the only one. And I do want to make sure that I am training more people who are interested in being the resource in these spaces um, to 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 do that and then you know garner these tools and the vocabulary and all of these things so that they can feel safe but they can also empower others to feel safe in those spaces um to everyone here it was such an honor thank you so so very much i loved hearing your perspectives i hate that i have to go because i love being in on these conversations um william fantastic job you're a great moderator i might have you come and hang out with me a little bit what a wonderful thank you all so much. i dropped your website in here but if you have any other information to give us about sunday please do Wonderful. I think, um, yes, Jordan pasted the link there. It's on Eventbrite. And you can find my, uh, me at, at Tavia Reve on pretty much anything. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thank one. Oh, I'm sad to see her leave, but um, I do want to get back. I'm, I, I want to segue into q and I do. I want to say a little piece and then Jordan, I got to hear from you too, because I know you have some insight here. Um, but this is theater, right? You go to a theater to be with people on the other side of some divide. I didn't have that reaction. You gasped and I learned about humanity or you laughed 
And I learned about humanity because you're different than me. And if I don't want that experience, if I want everyone to have the same, I want to sit with my friends and watch this TV or, or sit alone. That is so brilliant to me, Lucienne. I, I wouldn't mind hearing a, another way that you think the theater that you're participating is working because I, I have, I've been away from Oakland Theater Project for a few years now. And I came and saw a show next to a person whose car, my car was worth their hubcap but I felt like it was my show. And part of that was my experience with you. If you could just sprinkle a couple words about what, how you're curating that, how you, are, how you are fighting the idea of a donor class that owns the entire enterprise. That is a great question. Um, well, obviously I came into Oakland Theater Project before COVID. So my methods of interacting with the patrons were starkly different. I was not like, addressing a row of vehicles. I was addressing like human faces and emotions and eyeballs that I could see. Um, uh, wow. I think it's that I don't have anything to gain from treating somebody better than somebody else. Mm. And, and, and I think that, um, when you're front facing, when you're front of house, that's a little easier to access than if you're somebody dealing with the money kind of behind the scenes and you know what the budget is and you know what we need to make for the next show or like whatever. Um, and I do get, you know, um, comments of, you know, make sure to tell them, don't forget to tell the audience about like the donation link and don't forget. And it's like, that is, that is important. And I, I try not to forget, um, but, I think it boils down to that. Like I'm not look, I'm not trying to get anything out of the patron. I'm trying to give something to the patron. And I wouldn't want to give one patron something that I wasn't giving another. Um, and if anything, I have the perspective to understand that one patron might already have more than one has, be it like a VIP seat or, you know, more a subscription to the show. So they get to come seven times this year and this person is coming just today. Uh, because they're in town and happen to see this. Um, and it's thinking about that now, I think it would be really beneficial for front of house to have more transparency on that relationship um, with people that uh, deal with like donations and money and, and the budgeting. Um, because yes, like, of course you, you want to ask those who can give to give if, they want and if they can again if they can um but people will if they want to i i'm kind of of that philosophy um i think that you yeah you have to ask but no you really don't um i think that if a theater goer especially a subscriber um knows what your theater is about i think that if a person like you know like oakland theater project in specific is a nonprofit organization that does um, function, I think, I think mostly off of its donations and subscription sales. I think that ticket sales themselves only cover like so much of a, so much of even like a single production's budget. I know it's, it's not that much. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it, it always comes down to transparency and communicating. If the community knows how you're putting up this show and they have, they have to give, I think that they will, um, and I'm, yeah, I don't need to, I don't think anyone needs to kind of like, there's an expression I want and I'm not finding it. I'm gonna use one that's worse, so I'm just not gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> Censor. Yes, I, I, that, that was brilliant to me. And, and you know, people will deny their own experience if they create a theater that is single-minded. I don't think I, I want everyone to just know that, that you, you come to the theater for that diverse experience. You come to hear a kid laughing and an old person crying at something you don't understand. And you come for that. Jordan, you invited us all here. I know you've been thinking about this. What, what policies, what improvements do we need to make in our theater before we're really ready to invite this change? That is an excellent question. And I don't have an answer, which is why I invited so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but I think um, like stuff that Tavia has said hits the nail on the head and like everything that folks have really said of like, you really need to communicate 
transparently with your audiences what you're going to do, even if you don't know what that is yet. Like the reason that we're having civic conversations again is because people asked for transparency. So while they may not be thinking of like how I'm going to go into the theater space next week, they want to know that we're thinking about it. Um, so I really love the idea of like really clearly communicating what we're going to do or what's going to happen next. Like I know Aurora has like their audience like expectations, their little community agreements that are posted in their lobby. I love that. I feel like we all should be doing that. I, f I also feel like truthfully in the Bay Area as an industry, we should be standardizing how we expect to treat human beings like human beings. Like that's a thing for me that like this conversation is great because I know that I can get off this call and then tomorrow I'll be like, Amy, she loves Lucy Ann, let's talk. What do we all want to see in our theaters and how do we convince the people above us that this is, the, this is what we should be doing so that people come into our space and not feel like they're being othered. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have the answers. I would, I would love basic human decency. I'm like, <laughs> what else do we start with other than treating people like people? That is a great point. We've all worked in each other's spaces. We are not the community of our, our banner name. We're all in this together. I love that. Sheila, were you about to say something? Yeah, I um, am thinking about this idea of transparency and how everything that we do in theater is so process oriented, right? And we're putting up a show and performing the show and taking down the show and putting up another one. Um, when I was uh, one of my early teachers, um, their technical set company was called Space Changers. And that always stuck with me because I thought it was such a good analogy for the uh, continuing evolution of what happens within the theater space. So even as we talk about um, entrenched ritual and habits, and you know, uh, I work at a predominantly white institution, um, and a, it feels like so much is entrenched and it's so fast that we just don't have time to think, think things through. When we don't have the answers, we might need to ask more questions. And uh, I think, you know, we've talked about the variety of different kinds of theater experiences, whether you're going into um, uh, a building that feels more formal or whether you're going to an outdoor venue or, um, you know, I came up doing community theater, which was super scrappy. Um, and I think um, as we navigate these questions between these different kinds of theaters, you know, why do we do it this way? How long have we been doing it this way? Is there a different way that we can do it? Um, and I, I think, you know, the Bay Area is so famous for um, uh, tech companies and tech disruptors. Um, and I think part of that model is, um, you know, oh, how it, what is, what is the phrase that they say? Um, don't try to change the existing thing to be the way you want it to be, make a new thing that makes the old one obsolete. And I, I'm gonna back that up and say, I personally don't necessarily agree with throwing everything away and making something new. Um, I, I prefer some careful consideration, um, but I also think we really need to be much more holistic in the questions that we are asking. How does this affect all of the stakeholders? That's a great point. Amy, were you about to say something too? Well, yeah, I was gonna bring up the specter of reopening after COVID <laughs> and audience expectations around that, if that's all right. I'm sorry to invoke the name of it, but it, it uh, I think part of what makes me an all right box office manager is that I traffic in anxiety. I always anticipate the worst things and that makes me at least somewhat prepared for the actual situation that happens. So one of the things that I am thinking a lot about is this much needed change in um, like how we express to audiences like the what our expectations around them returning to the space in terms of being active community members and individuals in the space. 
um, that coupled with the very real safety needs around returning to a space post COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so William, you'd mentioned before the difference between safety and comfort. The thing that, that I think about a lot with returning to a space post COVID is that that kind of inverts a little bit. Um, it might feel more comfortable to take your mask off in a dark room, but it is, uh, it is pushing up against other folks' actual safety. So I've, I've been, we've had a lot of conversations and there's been no absolute consensus around it. Um, Cause again, it's an ongoing talk as recommendations continue to change. Um, but I like to pretend that we're gonna be opening in a month even though that's not the case. And it's like looking at how to write up policies and talk to folks about it. Um, and so a lot of what I've been thinking about is what expectations we're going to be putting on audience members when they come in terms of COVID related safety measures, uh, whether that be distancing, whether that be mask wearing, whether that be showing some sort of uh, vaccination card at the door. Again, none of these are, are solidified. These are things that have just been batted around in the ether. Um, but all of those things combined with the fact that the folks who will most likely be the people enforcing that are gonna be front of house individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means for the space again, in conjunction with this, or at, rather, not in conjunction with, at the same time as reopening and expressing new expectations around how we interact with each other. Um, so I'm, I, it's a big question that I have for myself and I, I don't anticipate that there are any solid answers, but if anyone has any thoughts or things that you've been ruminating on, I would love to hear it. Yeah, Sheila. I have thoughts. <laughs> San Francisco Playhouse is reopening in one week. We have our first preview for live indoor audiences next Tuesday, June 8th. So we are in the thick of these preparations. Um, a handful of our staff has gone through COVID compliance officer training. Um, our box office team has worked with our ticketing software to um, uh, ensure physical distance spacing between um, between groups of patrons within the house. Um, we've, we've got our, our processes uh, pretty much written down on paper. We're communicating them to ticket buyers via email. Um, and, uh, you know, coming back to what I said right at the beginning, it feels really fast to me. To me personally, it feels like too fast, too soon, but here we are. Uh, somebody's got to do it <laughs> um, and, and we're, we're figuring it out. And it, um, it brings up, Amy, just what you said, this idea of, of safety in a, um, a public health arena. Um, and that overlaps with some of the ideas that we've been talking about in terms of perceived risk and emotional safety. Um, I can tell you that as a house manager, um, I am serious about enforcing mask wearing in the house. I don't wanna see anybody with their mask dripping below their nose or hanging under their chin. Um, and I think even though people are getting vaccinated and uh, the, the situation does seem to be improving. I think for our theater right now, we need to set a policy and stick with the policy for one show. And when that show closes, we can reevaluate that public health policy and reestablish it for the next show, but it needs to not be a moving target. And I think that comes back to what Tavia said about establishing the guidelines and the boundaries so that we can feel safe to move freely within them. Mm. And I'm gonna bring up another thing, which is a bit tangential, but I think is important to the work that all of, uh, all of us do here. Um, there is, there is also the aspect of the physical safety of the physical buildings that we work in. And this, this might seem a little bit off topic for our conversation today, but I think it's another thing that rarely gets discussed. Um, 
I think many of the theaters that I have worked in can pay more attention to the physical safety and the health code regulations for the buildings that we work in. And I think that often gets shuffled to the bottom of the priority list. And it often gets excused as something that creative people don't need to pay attention to. But there's a reason that you're not supposed to shout fire in a theater. And I think I personally am an advocate for theater companies actually practicing fire drills on a regular basis. And I've never seen that happen. So I know that's off topic for our, our conversation, but I do think it is an extension of, of what we're discussing. And if we had an OSHA panelist here, I, I think that they would agree and say there's probably more than just that, that in, in this culture of urgency, we're willing to ignore, we're willing to ignore the individual's rights uh, as well as safety. Uh, uh, yes, Jordan. Um, Sheila, it's a tangent, but it's a tangent that people don't realize we think about. Mm. Like my front of house staff has had crowd management training because we need to know how to safely get people out of the building. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you are absolutely right that more places should be concerned about the safety. I know at Z Space, we did a full walkthrough of both spaces and noted any hazards. And we talked about how to fix them because that is a thing that is important. And because it, Z Space is a like former can warehouse. So like knowing where the nooks and crannies are of where somebody could get caught, where a wheelchair may not be able to make the correct turn backstage because there's not enough clearance. Like that is stuff we need to think about. And I appreciate you bringing up the tangent truthfully because I think that's also part of the stuff we need to think about is like, we need to invest in those trainings, invest in first aid training, crowd management, de-escalation, all of it. Like that's, that's all stuff we should be thinking about. So no, that's totally part of this conversation. And one more thing I'll add on to that is um, uh, when you say invest in training, I think that also means investing in um, the, the people who will come up after us to fulfill our jobs. Um, so I feel like a lot of people come to house management um, by very circuitous paths. It does, it's not necessarily a career goal that somebody set out to do. Um, and I think that we can make it a, um, a more clear career path and that having that kind of investment in training is one way to approach that. You know, I, I just unwittingly heard us finding two other groups of people who are also in, in this group of people that are being policed. Uh, we, we haven't really talked about handicap needs. We have ASL interpreters here with us. Um, a, a lot of the theaters I've worked at don't have ramp access and also bigger bodies. Um, bigger bodies in the theater, I often see getting policed of, you know, you're on my chair or, or you know, there, there's lots of groups. We're not just talking about race here. Um, I just want to say that we kind of organically went through most of our question and answers. So I hope our audience is satisfied. There was one more that I want to address. So I feel really, really satisfied here is, uh, and I think this is based on a, a question that you were giving us, Amy. What risks can we take in positive ways? Can you relate specific experiences where you were able to de-escalate fast? How are the ways we're actually solving this? And just to point out, this is our last five minutes, um, so we'll keep it brief. Sure, uh, brevity is not always my strong suit, but I will do my best. Um, so a couple of things. I mentioned before that I'm a member of the San Francisco Neo Futurists. It's an ensemble whose work uh, the aesthetic is based on what we call non-illusory theater, which just means that we don't play characters and that there's not a fourth wall. So when something happens in the audience, we're able to address it really in the moment. So someone's phone goes off, someone's having a response of any kind, positive or let's say constructive, uh, there's a literal dialogue that happens. Um, granted, this is a pretty big swing in the direction of uh, performer audience interactions, but it's a really interesting counterpoint to me as someone working front of house 
in terms of when someone in the audience's feelings get to the point that they just want to express it, uh, again, whether that be positive or critical, uh, what is gained by having that happen in that moment? Um, so again, a pretty, a pretty big swing, but I think that that's an area, I think that reevaluating the audience performer or the, the divide, the fourth wall divide that happens is an interesting place to start. Um, not anything that I have answers for. As for quick de-escalation, I mean, <laughs> I, there, there are myriad instances. I will say that as a, as a quick pro tip for anyone out there in the world looking to de-escalate someone, um, when someone arrives at the theater and they're no longer allowed to be seated because we don't have late seating, letting them know like, oh, sorry, we sent out an email in advance. Uh, we sent out an email three days before and day of, do you happen to get it? They sometimes get missed. And as the person's looking for the email on their phone, which contains the information about no late seating, it gives them time to focus on something else. They're not looking at me. They're not getting continually escalated. They're focused on a new task. So by the time they see the email, they go, oh. And by that time I can say, so sorry that happened. Let's see if we can get you into another date. We're happy to waive the exchange fee this time. And then we're on the same team. So <laughs> pro tip from, from me to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's myriad ones there. Yeah, codifying these rituals in a really clear way seems like it just popped back up for us. Um, so y'all, we are coming to a close. We got a couple minutes left. I wouldn't mind going around the room and hearing um, just like a couple sentences about your last thought and maybe an event that you wanna promote coming up. Uh, when is your theater opening? What are, what are you doing next? Anything. Um, Jordan, can we start with you? Thank you. Um, this, I'm really excited that this conversation even happened. I feel like all of us have such varied experiences that we're bringing here, um, that this should, this is just the first of this conversation. Like, I really do hope Sheila and I connected on Facebook. I really do hope that like a front of house round table comes out of this to that we're like, we all join together and just start saying like, these are the things that we would like to see. And we're going to take this back. And this is what we're going to do. Um, cause I feel like the environment that we create, we really do. I know you can't control everything, but there are some things that you can. Um, so I'm just really thrilled that this happened. Uh, and Amy, I have totally done that same pro tip of no late seating. Actually, let me, let me get you into a new date right now. Let's walk to the box office. Let's do it. Um, I have totally done that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so ZSpace is actually not planning to reopen to the public until October. Uh, so this is an early conversation for us, but it's a very relevant conversation to still be having. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Uh, and I'm going to pass it, if I may, to Lucianne. Um, last thought. Well, let me start with what's going on at Oakland Theater Project. Um, we are in the midst of our uh, drive-in season. Um, we are also streaming those shows virtually. Um, I believe you can see those on demand and you can see a live performance and there might be two different options for that. We did just wrap up the Wasteland and we are now into uh, Begin the Begin. I haven't been there for this show, so I apologize for <laughs> my by not knowing. Um, I've been just doing box office this round. Um, but the drive-in experience seems to be really popular amongst a lot of folks. So if that feels safe for you, uh, please check it out. Um, it is at the Flax. My pup is running back there. Uh, it is at the Flax um, art store in Oakland on 16th Street uh, in that parking lot. Um, and yeah, I'm really grateful that this conversation was had today. Um, it was really great to get to hear from so many different people in so many different spaces. Uh, Amy, I loved the last thing that you said. I just wanted to say that was very pro professional <laughs> house <laughs> management. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for, and thank you, uh, William, for moderating thank you jordan for bringing this all together really appreciate that yeah this was excellent sheila 
Oh, goodness. Uh, so I mentioned that the San Francisco Playhouse is reopening for live indoor theater starting next week. Uh, we are um, uh, going to be performing Hold These Truths by Jean Sakata, which is a one man show uh, about uh, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, goes into preview June 8th, opens June 12th, runs uh, through the month of June. I think uh, July 3rd is our closing date. It is also available for video streaming. Um, and uh, I think house management, you know, we've talked a lot about um, things happening very fast and when we get to slow down and there's, there very, very often feels that time crutch of um, five minutes till curtain. Um, and you got to, you know, get every, the uh, box office line cleared and the concessions line cleared and the restroom cleared and we've got two floors to handle and it does feel like go, go, go. And um, what I find very useful is for me to remember to come back to my breath. And this is my actor training to take a breath and ground myself in my breath. And if I am calm, it helps me to again, model the behavior for the patron to be calm. And it's just theater, it's not brain surgery. We're here to have a good time. That was beautiful, thank you. And kick us off, Amy. Um, of course, first, I wanna thank you all so much with a special thanks to Jordan for leading this, bringing us all here and to William for asking some really excellent questions. Um, I also, oh, what are we doing? Shotgun Players does have our shows for two series. We have a bridge series, which are smaller productions. So three smaller productions that will lead us into our 30th anniversary season. Uh, we are announcing our dates on June 15th, barring any acts of God, uh, with uh, dates opening up for reservations on July 15th and opening up to single ticket buyers in August 15th. If you're looking at that timeline, that means that we are anticipating opening in the fall. Again, barring any major acts of God, I'm very excited for it. Um, regardless, <laughs> in spite of all of the things that I do very much think need to be changed about um, what we view as the regular modes and expectations of theater, um, I am very heartened by the reaction of so many of our audience members and the, how receptive a lot of folks have been. So even though there will continue to be individuals who will need more attention in these movements, um, I am overall heartened by um, the, the personal work that I've seen individuals doing. Um, and I hope that that is indicative of larger changes. Um, other than that, I'll also like personally shout out the SF Neo Futurist one more time. Um, we do have a monthly digital show, and this month we're going to do our Pride show, which is World Pride Wrench, um, which will be happening at the end of this month. More information coming up uh, shortly. It's always a good time. Love to see you there. Uh, and again, thank you to everyone. I've, I've written down so many notes, and I'm so, it's just nice to be outside of my microcosm. It's more <laughs> than just me, like, being like, does everyone else feel this? And it's nice to know that, no, it's not just me. So I will be finding you on social media. So thank you. Y'all, this was so beautiful. I really, really appreciated this. I grew from this today. Um, my final thoughts today are, I'm, I'm really excited about these theater companies or representatives from them talking about how we're gonna be really clear with our audiences about who's invited, about what our new rituals are, about how we, we look and pay attention to one another. I'm excited about sharing these resources. I know that some of us are guinea pigs, but we're all gonna be doing this in a year's time. So I hope we learn from each other um, um, share, uh, you know, uh, emergency resources that don't have to be the police, all, all, of, all of these things. So I'm ready for that front of house conference. And then I just want to drive home for myself and for the audiences that these women put up with a lot of personalities. If you're an actor, you put up with a lot of personalities and we do it because that's what feels right. They, they are invited in the room always. We are, I, I really trust this group to be rehabilitative. No one's getting kicked out of the theater. We just wanna make sure that we change the way that we're paying attention to one another. Um, so big ups to Tavia who isn't here. I know someone's gonna drop her link in the box, but what great insights. Um, I just wanna say thank you again for our ASL interpreters, how important that we could share this with everyone. Thank all three of you. And uh, Rachel, behind the scenes, thank you for being there and, and, and steering us this whole time. 
Uh, and with that, I wanna give it back to Jordan. Thank you so much, I feel full. Thank you all so much for attending tonight's conversation. Thank you again to William, Amy, Lucianne, Sheila, Tavia for your beautiful participation in this. Also sharing my beautiful, wonderful, appreciative thanks to my black women interpreters, <laughs> Melissa, Katura, and Candice, and Rachel who is doing us a wonderful solid as our behind the scenes tech goddess. Uh, thank you all again for coming. Um, the next Z Civic Conversation will be in August and that topic will be released soon. All right, folks, have a good night. Bye. Thank y'all.